Hey, everybody, this is Andy Kern from Envy of None, and you're listening to the Brutally Delicious Podcast. Thank you for joining us, Andy. That's my partner, Rena, and Chris, as you know. Hello. Great to meet everybody. Hello. Are you guys all in the U.S.? I'm in Richmond. Yes. Oh, sorry. I'm in I'm in Virginia. Bruce is in Virginia. Rena's in Finland. Oh wow. Okay. But I grew up in Canada, so okay. uh, this band is maybe a little bit closer to my heart than than uh, some others. No pun intended. <laughs> closer yeah. to my heart, right? No yeah. pun. <laughs> <laughs> It actually yeah. wasn't intended, but that was pretty good. If that being yeah. the case, you want to lead the way, Chris? Yeah. So this track, um, it reminds me of like a more modern version of Morchiba. And Morchiba, do you know Morchiba? I do. And which, Chris, which track are we talking about in particular? Um, it was the one that Bruce sent me, and I got it right here. Liar. Let me get it open. Liar. Liar, yes. Okay. So when I heard that track, I was just like, this sounds like a really modern version of Morchiba. And at the time, when I was listening to this track, I didn't know it was you and Alex Life Lifeson. I had no idea. And I was like, this is a great track. Then when I found that out, my first thought was, how the hell did this happen? These two <laughs> classic rock gods come together and do nothing classic rock related <laughs> at all. Like, how the hell does this happen? Well, thank you for the kind words and um, classic rock gods. That's some pretty good accolades. Anyway, um, <laughs> I have to tell you that um, for quite some time, uh, I've been working at home at my home studio and on my desktop, there's a folder and the folder is called Auntie Drew. And my friends call me Drew. So it's it's anything that you would not expect from me. So there's a lot of there's a lot of electronic stuff in there. There's some ambient, there's some industrial, like all of the things that that you might hear in Liar or um, the Enemy and None record is um, it is is seeds of ideas that I was having fun sort of scratching a different itch. And um, ironically, Alex and I got approached to write some music for film and television together. And the more that we spoke about um, this project, the more that I found out that Alex had some similar interests in electronic and um, ambient and just like trippy stuff, you know. So yeah. we, so Chris, we started scratching this itch. Which full disclaimer, we were joking around saying we should have a sticker on the front of the Envy of None record saying this isn't Rush, this isn't Coney Hatch. Warning. <laughs> yeah, that was my first thought. Like, like I was just like, this doesn't like my, my brain was i couldn't compute what was happening but i was enjoying it at the same time you know and i it made me realize how much personal bias comes in when you look at musicians that you grew up with you know because growing up in canada rush and coney hatch were like everywhere you couldn't yeah you couldn't escape it it was everywhere and it became a, ingrained in the culture do you know what i mean and i think this will do the same but in a different way it really made me look at deep inside myself for my personal bias, to be honest. Yeah. And Chris, it's an interesting point because I think certainly speaking for myself, I'm, I'm at the core of, of who I am is a huge music fan. And I'm the first guy to have expectations about buying something and expecting something. And, you know, like I'll, I'll pull, I'll pull a random one from my hat, Michael Schenker from UFO. Oh I'll yeah. Lo love his guitar playing. And if I buy something that Michael's involved with, I'm going to expect it's going to be leaning towards what he's done before. So I'm the first guy to get, you know, pissed off about that. If they, if anybody strays from their comfort zone, but on the flip side of that, and a huge topic of discussion that we've had in all of our interviews is the, I guess, the liberating part of doing this project with Alex and also with Maya, who really, um, if you do any research on Maya, you'll find out that she's pretty much straight down the middle, sort of what I would call folk Americana. Yeah. So for us to sort of open the blinders, stretch out, try some different stuff stylistically, it was very liberating. It was really enjoyable. 
we started out really just collaborating with no label, no management, no, um, you know, no producer. It was just four artists just collaborating. We had a blast doing it. And it wasn't, and, and there was no real discussion like, let's make sure we don't include anything that sounds like Rush or Coney Hatch. It was just ideas that we were sending around to people. And it would almost be like if I sent Rena something going, here's 10 ideas, which one do you like? And she says, I like number three and four. Okay, great. We're going to work on those. So it wasn't that we consciously made a, a pact together, like let's hit the knuckles and go, we're not going to do anything like that. But, um, you know, on Liar, certainly there's some nasty fuzzy bass on there. And, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm guilty as charged on, on, you know, distorting my bass on other projects. And, but this one got a little, we, we stretched the, you know, we pushed the perimeters on it. I was doubling my bass guitar, like a guitar player would double his guitar as I did that multiple times throughout the record. And Alex um, was really enjoying creating what he called soundscape guitar tones, not your traditional, I'm going to plug in a clean guitar and do a nice little clean bit. Because uh, on, on the track Look Inside, for instance, the intro of Look Inside is all Alex Lifeson. And if you, to the average listener, me included, when he sent it, I had no idea it was guitar. I said, I love what you did, but did you play any guitar on it? He's like, yes, <laughs> the, intro, the intro is the guitar, you know? So, and, and I said, man, I'm just picturing you at home with a white lab coat on creating these sounds and textures and everything. And um, he really enjoyed that, uh, you know, I think it was part of a, um, just being a musician, you kind of like to stretch, but you're absolutely right, Chris. It's, I could see it on the flip side. There's been a small minority of Rush fans that are like, this is not my cup of tea. Like, this is not Rush, you know? Yeah. It, it's totally my cup of tea. It's just, it, it kind of like hit me out of the left field, you know? I was like, it, cause you see the names and you're like, okay, I know what to expect. Right. And then suddenly I'm listening to like this ambient electronic kind of soul. Like I don't even know how to describe it like from a, but it was just emotionally impactful. And I was just like, and there's a woman singer. And I was just like, which brings me to my next question. How did you meet Maya? How like. You took my question, dude. Oh, like, we're just sorry. quiet here with We'll Rose. let, we'll like, let Rena ask that okay, question. Rena. Oh. Okay, go ahead, Rena. You ask the question and I'll answer. How did you find Maya? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there was, um, I won't go into great lengths about a chapter in my personal career, but there was a period between sort of, um, I'm going to say early 2000s for about 12 years where I went over and I started working with um, Rush as their A&R person at their label part of their management company. Um, I was the only musician in the office, so I was looking after the, the boys' endorsement deals with Fender and Gibson and BW Drums and stuff like that, right? And I would constantly get asked to be a judge for a battle of the band contest or a talent contest here, or would you go to this showcase? And I honestly, I'm, I'm very happy to do that and I enjoy it. And, and part of me thinks, that it's a good thing for me to give back to to younger artists who if i can shorten the ride on the way up then i'm happy to show up or offer any advice so this particular um day i got a call saying asking me if i would be a judge for an online music competition and um, the person that asked me said i'll make your job really easy for you i'm going to send you 10 songs and rate them one being your favorite 10 being your least favorite and we're going to pick five winners and once we pick the five winners um would you be open to being part of this prize where you're going to be a guest mentor for a, a, as a music industry expert? And I was like, well, that sounds like a pretty crappy prize, but yes, no problem. <laughs> right. And um, so fast forward, Maya is one of the finalists and um, we started off the call as you would expect it to be where she was asking advice. And at the time she was 21 years old and talking about sort of, you know, Andy, can you give me some advice on next steps? How do I further my career? How can I get a little bit um, uh, further ahead? And we started talking about songwriting and collaborating. 
she sent me three songs and one of them was quite different. It was almost like that Sesame Street, you know, one of these, one of these things is not like the other. And I was like, tell me about that song. Right. Yeah. And so she had written it with, with someone and they had left town and she had lost contact. And she, and I said, so I gave her the rah, rah speech. I said, look at, that's part of the job as a musician. You got to network, you got to meet people, you got to go out and talk to, if you're an opening act, introduce yourself to the headliner or, you know, go see open mics and meet people. And then without even breaking you guys, she said, well, I looked you up on the, on the internet. Um, what about if we were to write some songs together? And I was not expecting that at all. So <clears throat> into going back to the Auntie Drew folder, I told her about it. I said, I'm not going to send you anything hard rock or metal or, you know, anything like that. And I started sending ideas to her. Track two on the record is a song called Shadow. I sent her about a two minute idea of that and she loved it and started working on it. And, and that was the humble beginnings of sort of my and I meeting each other and, and collaborating online. And to sort of jump ahead to the next question, I... I shared that little piece of music with her singing on it to, with Alex and with Alfio. And I said, guys, I really think I've found somebody pretty special here with Maya. I, I love her vocals and I love her sense of harmony and her lyrics and everything. And both of them said, man, she's awesome. We should, we should start working together on this. And that was, that was how Envy of Dunn came together. Amazing. Wow. That is crazy. From a talent show to yeah. working with rock gods. It's yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, but my, like, my, I, I, I do want to say this it yeah. took some serious courage to be like well i looked you up on the internet why don't we write together that that's a courageous move and a lot of people wouldn't see it that way yeah you know well it's funny you said that chris we um i jokingly said to people after the fact that she had balls the size of montreal which is <laughs> a, which is a big city here in canada yeah, yeah and she loved the phrase so much that she said she's going to get a t-shirt with you know, balls in montreal written on it <laughs> nice. but but you know what it was and i mean this very respectfully like maya is so young and when when you haven't been around the block a, a, a bunch of times and, and, and you're, you're, you know, I wouldn't say that I'm jaded, but you, once you've been around for a while, you kind of go, oh, I'm not going to go there. Or you have preconceived notions about things. And so it was, it was tabled very innocently, very naively, very genuine. Like, why don't we just work together? I'm a songwriter. You're a songwriter. Yeah. And the interesting thing was on the call when I told her that I had played it for my friend, Alex. And uh, she said, oh, tell me about Alex a little bit. And I said, well, <laughs> he's in he's in the Rock and Roll Hall right. of Fame. And and, yeah. and 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 it was kind of water off a duck's back. She was like, oh, yeah, my parents, I, I, I know my parents listen to that band. And whether or not she was intimidated or not, she didn't show it at all. It, she just took it in stride. The very first time we she came to Toronto um, and we met up and she sang some vocals and, and we, we did some drum tracks, we went up for a bite to eat. And, and even then, the genuine sort of naivety came out where she said, you know, we sh when we're finished, we should play some shows together. And Alex was just like, <laughs> he was eating his dinner and he was like, huh. You know, and I, I just want to go, Maya, you know, this guy just sold out an entire tour, you know, and right. they were offered Lollapalooza and Coachella and everything, right? And Alex was just very humble. He said, oh, yeah, well, let's see how it goes. Maybe we will play some shows together. But um, none of those instinctual music industry things where potentially if she was a, a little bit younger or more experience she might have thought there's no way in hell i'm gonna ask alex lifeson to play any live shows but she didn't it just came out naturally like when we're done we should play some shows that's yeah. that's awesome, awesome. And, and yeah I, like not, e yeah, not even Chris, thinking it's like our turn you be quiet now for a moment like we have <laughs> seven minutes left on this goddamn episode and you've been talking throughout the fucking thing all right <laughs> <laughs> Speak your mind, Rina. I'm a gonna, because I also have the ball size of Helsinki, which is the capital of Finland where I am. Yes. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> no, I totally want to, like, you know, Maya, if you listen to this, you go girl. That's the way you do this thing. Like, right. That's the way you do it. Like, no, no apologizing. Like, grow those balls even bigger. Make them the size of Lake Erie, which I don't know if they're smaller. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> Montreal but that is awesome but I just really 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 wanted to say that that music is awesome 
this is why I do this podcast is to find bands that, you know, for some other reason will not like cross my radar. And this is a huge find for me. Envy of None is excellent. So if like you are not familiar with this band, everybody needs to get familiar with it. And you're completely right about Maya's voice and the lyrics and everything. It's like super, it's soothing and it's touching and it's gripping and it's like all these good things put into one. So the what was it? Non Brett, un Brett, <laughs> Drew, <laughs> Brett, <Yeah. laughs> Brett, <laughs> the, on, on Drew or non Drew? What oh, the, was the, it? The, like, the, the anti Drew. Yep, the anti Drew. Anti Drew. Yep. Yep. Good guy. Like I like that guy. Like, give well, him more food. Grow him bigger. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Rena. Thank you for saying that because. Um, I think the the real interesting sort of combination and juxtaposition that I think Envy of None has, and and you know, Chris, you said at the beginning of the of the interview that you couldn't really put your finger on it, and and I'm and we're happy about that. We're proud. We think we carved a little bit of new territory, and sure, there's some influences that come out, but there were times, um, Rena, during the record where we would send her something that was a little bit nastier, like a song like Enemy or maybe Dog's Life. And she would call me up and the two of us being lyricist and vocalist, she would say to me, you know, I really think I should push on this one. I think I should maybe scream a little bit. And I said, honestly, this juxtaposition that we found between, let us get nasty. You just do your beautiful, mysterious, evocative, layers of harmony soothing as you said like I go what just you be you and let us be nasty around you because that combination is what I think makes this record a little bit special you know and um so we 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 advised her not to push it and just do what she does great and and her like I honestly feel she's wise beyond her years and and um, we did a couple interviews and somebody said, Maya, do you think you've won the lottery when you wake up every day? Like, you know, somebody, cause we kind of just plucked her out of Portland, Oregon and plopped her in our project, but it really was, she was a big part of this thing. And you mentioned all these styles. It's the four of us and our influences and you throw them in a blender and you hit go and it swirls around and it spits out envy and none. So without her, I think it would sound very, very different because she's the icing on the cake for us. Right. I know you, you mentioned that you kind of toyed around with it. Are you guys planning on taking this out on the road at all now that things are more open and or is that not a thing? Um, well, Bruce, I have a funny story about that because it's sort of the it's sort of the extension of Maya sitting saying down, you know, when we're done, we should play some shows. Right. So then when so we got together after the record. So it would, so full transparency before we started, when we were about two or three tracks in, Maya came to Toronto, got some vocals, did some drum tracks, did the entire record remotely, sending files back and forth from the US to back and back to us. And then at the end of the record, we were like, it's done. The COVID's over. Come and, and celebrate with us, right? So we went out for another dinner. And in that in that dinner, Bruce, Maya says to us, you know, I was talking to my mom and she thinks we should try to play get on Jimmy Kimmel. That would be a good show. We should, <laughs> should, should play on Jimmy Kimmel, right? I love <laughs> this woman. She's right? like my new totem animal. I love yeah. that. <laughs> so I so Alex was like, huh. Jimmy Kimmel, eh? Huh. Well, that might be fun. And, you know, for a guy who has spent 40 plus years on the road, he's been very vocal that he is in no hurry to get back out on the road. Sure. I'm sort I'm sort of the next guy there. I've certainly paid my dues and spent a lot of times in truck stops and tour buses. And but the but the two of us felt that A, the music would be very cool to try to take it to the stage and and we you know we were talking about graphic graphically or or you know just visually what we could do with screens and beautiful lighting and everything and so we kind of did a gentleman's handshake that we would be open to doing a handful of the right kind of shows I don't think we would grind it out for 30 or 40 shows if there was some maybe an opportunity to play at a festival or something or a special a special show we would look at it but um I can't see anything lengthy going on. And if Maya was on the call with us, you know, right now, she would say, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to do 150 <laughs> right. shows, right? But she's young but and, she, and ready. 
Right. And, and, um, and we respect that, but I think at the same time, like, and I mean this respectfully to the other members of the band, you, you plop Alex Lifeson in this project and he is a heat seeking missile. If you pull him out, I don't know whether we would be getting such attention and I know it wouldn't have sounded the same, but having Alex in there, we have to respect what the guy's been through for so many years. And he loved being involved in the writing of this. And um, when I was over at his place the other day, his wife said to me, I'm hearing all sorts of great stuff. Don't you dare take my husband out on the road. I just got him back. (laughs) (laughs) Right. After all those years, I imagine so. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Amazing. And I understand. I mean, like, like you say, Alex is like the last rush tour was sold out worldwide. Like it didn't, like it almost seemed to never end that tour. Yeah. Like, my God. Well, Chris, you're right. Every single date uh, was sold out. And I can tell you that went on good authority because I was part of the management team and the label at that time. And um, all of those guys came up with different ways to keep themselves busy on the, on, on the tour because it's grinding, it's relentless. So Alex is a golf junkie. He was playing what, like his itinerary for his golf games was as elaborate as the tour itinerary because he'd be like, <laughs> Okay, we got a day off in Phoenix. I got two rounds, and then the day of the show, I got a round at eight o'clock in the morning. And you know, and and Neil's on the floor in in his dressing room with an old school map, and he's mapping out where he's going to drive his motorcycle. And Getty's figuring out where he can go to vintage wine stores on the day off to get his wine collection. And these guys are, you know, going into great detail to try to come up with some really fun ways to kill the time on the road because it can just be your 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 average fan only sees the two hours on stage they don't see the other like sure. you know 22, 22 hours of traveling hotels sound checks interviews all this kind of stuff right yeah but uh, but uh, getting back to the golf it was quite challenging recording this record because we had to schedule it around alex's golf schedule during summer <laughs> i i understand this because i'm also a golf junkie and like sometimes like when you're younger if you're a golf junkie it can ruin relationships because golf is like some people like it and some people don't you either love it or hate you hate it but if you love it mm, man yeah <laughs> it could take over your life pretty easily <laughs> well the last thing i'll tell you guys is so as the season's approaching he's like i can't wait the weather's amazing i'm gonna go out to the, the driving range and then by the end of it he's like i can't wait for the season to end because i've been playing terrible so it's it, <laughs> it, it, it it's this um i don't know it's this uh problem area for alex it's love hate but i i'm 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 not joking when i tell when i i would call him up and go hey i sent you you know we sent you a song about five days ago and he's like i know i've been playing four times this week and so he then he'd wedge in some guitar parts and send it to us and get back out to the golf course right (laughs) andy i hate to do this but we're running up against time rena do you have anything else real quick No, just a big thank you for the music, because like I said, it was excellent and it's going to stay with me for for a long, long time. Yeah, it's been added on my playlist, too. Andy, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, everybody. Sorry if I was rambling and you didn't get your questions in, but I had a blast today and so nice to meet everybody. And thank you for the kind words. We, We really are proud of the record. We yeah. definitely got and three fans here. We're all loving it. And I'm just going to say it. If you end up taking it on the road, make sure one of those roads is in Washington, D.C. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And this is, the, this is a rambling kind of show, so no apologies needed. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well, Rena, Bruce, Chris, great to meet you guys. Happy, you to come, happy to come on again down the line. And uh, thank you for making the time for us.